God, we uh, come now to you uh, wanting to hear your voice through your word. Thank you for this time. Prepare our hearts, God, for you and your message to us. Amen. Okay, so this morning we are reading Acts chapter 3, verse um, seven, 17, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, 17 through to the end of chapter 3, which is verse 36, or 26, sorry, 17 through 26. So I'll start here. Um, and on the basis of faith in Jesus' name. Oops. Sorry, that was 16. Let me go to 17. And now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance as your rulers did too. But the things God foretold long ago through all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. <clears throat> Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and so that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus. This one heaven must receive until the time all things are restored, which God declared from times long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must obey him in everything he tells you. Every person who does not obey that prophet will be destroyed and thus removed from the people. And all the prophets from Samuel and those who followed him have spoken about and announced these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your ancestors. Saying to Abraham, and in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each one of you from your iniquities. I think we could take one more pass through that. Sure. <clears throat> now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshment may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Okay. All right, so... This one's, for some reason, this one's harder for me to interpret. It feels like, I don't know. 
feels like he's using a lot of words here. Um, yes. <laughs> but maybe saying kind of the same thing over and over again. But what are your, what are you sensing from this? I kind of want to just outline it. Break it right. into four parts. What does this part mean? What does this part mean? Right. That's what it feels like. I kind of felt the same. Yeah, I, I mean, I only pulled out from listening. Again, just him, I guess he's just telling, warning them, like, hey, like, basically, like, repent. I said at the beginning of Acts, I think it was Acts 1. Mm. Or, or when the, when the, 3,000 were saved, like basically saying, repent, save your souls. Otherwise, you'll you'll perish or something, and quoting prophets. That's kind of all I got out of it. But... I was, my... There are two things. One of them was what you're saying, Sean, like repent. Um, the first part of what I was seeing is it's like, um, it's like, hey guys, this was all proph prophecy to happen. And so, so it's like he's appealing to to their knowledge about what the scriptures say. And also there's an aspect of them, I think that does care about, you know, maybe created in God's image um, and having the DNA of God within them. There's a desire to align with God's will. And so he's appealing to that part of them Saying, guys, this is this was prophecy to happen. It's in our scriptures. And and it happened. He came. The Messiah that we have been waiting for for so long. Sp spoken about by Moses. He he has come and it was Jesus. And it's interesting, verse 25 says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your ancestors, saying even to Abraham, like way back, and in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Guys, this is the blessing. Jesus, he was the promised blessing spoken to by God to Abraham, spoken to Moses, spoken to Samuel. And God has now raised up this blessing, this servant, this prophecy, and he has sent him first to you. You are the recipients. Like you are the first. <laughs> you are the first fruits. And God wants to bless you. But just repent, you know, just repent, turn from your iniquities, turn your face to the chosen one, to the Messiah. That must have been a really interesting message to hear. They're like, whoa. <laughs> I guess he's, he's, he's connecting all the dots all the way back to Abraham. Yeah. How would you feel if you're in that crowd, you think? Knowing that you are a part 
you were in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him, and shouting for Barabbas, free Barabbas, the murderer. And like hearing this message. Two months later. <laughs> like that. What would be going through your mind as you're, as you're hearing these, these words, knowing that you were in that crowd? If I was in that crowd, I'd probably <laughs> be forgetful, gone on with life, maybe, maybe. Because this was kind of, this was also an event that had been rippling outward pretty consistently by the sound of it. Like, oh yeah, remember that guy we crucified? Oh yeah, that <laughs> guy we crucified. Oh gosh, yeah, they did. They never found his body in the world. So... Jesus was fairly famous in in the area. Yeah. Pretty much everybody knew about. So maybe I wouldn't have been so forgetful. I picture myself hearing this message, you know, assuming let's say I was in the original crowd that was calling for his crucifixion, the mob. And my eyes opening for the first time, hearing Peter talk about, you know, all, all of these, like, what, what's the word? They're like the fathers of our faith, you know, the Jewish patriarchs, faith. patriarchs, you know, these patriarchs, these giants, these spiritual giants, you know, faith giants and. And, and, and the realization that, oh my God, they were talking about this Jesus that we killed. And like it just clicking in my head for the first time and being just so cut to the core of my heart. Oh no, like the realization of what I had done and how I, just this terrible sadness I think conviction I guess but then at the same time recognizing that it was prophecy to happen and I was a part of that prophecy because I was in the crowd calling for his crucifixion and just being in awe of God and his authority over all things. And then just falling to my knees and being like, just in like complete reverence of God and I, don't know, I, I would feel really convicted in that moment. But at the same time, sense sensing God's love and his willingness to die for me and the grace that he would have for me even though I was I had a hand in his physically like you know very palpably in his death so that crowd do you think it was like Romans you know non 
and other like non-Jewish Jewish people. Do you think do you think there were some you know Jewish people in there as well? Which crowd? This one or the one the, that was calling for Jesus' death, the mob? Yeah, the mob and you know. So I'm trying to like picture, you know, what what that audience would have been. And it's like you know, who who would know, you know, the old testament or the Torah? Who in that crowd would have known that? It's like Peter is this just kind of like a, a paraphrased little section of the of Peter basically teaching you know, a new message about Jesus, but using the old Old Testament and the Torah that they had studied as as maybe as Jewish people, but you know, how maybe maybe some people didn't know the Torah, and so he's he's pulling you know a teaching from the Torah and saying like, look at this this is what happened you may not know this but this is what our our book said you know from thousands of years ago mm -hmm. to this date you know? <clears throat> and then how we how we do that today in the modern church of like yeah we we pull from the old testament the torah but then we pull from jesus to teach and people that may not know it today as well as we do you know just to kind of get them to start down that journey to studying more of the Torah so what's what is the what is your point on that I was having trouble following you I'm just thinking of like the context of that that crowd because you were asking how we would feel, you know, if we were in that that crowd, if we were one of the people that were just, uh, you know, calling for Jesus' crucifixion, mm -hmm. and then and then hearing this message now, and I was trying to think of like, okay, maybe you know those people calling for Jesus' death, did they know the Torah or did they not? Because they're, you know, Peter's using the, the, the Torah for a lot of teaching to say like, hey, you know, this is what Abraham said and, you know, all that. So. Mm -hmm. I think that they did. I think that they knew. Probably to diff differing degrees, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I would think that they they knew it. I would think so as well, because it did say that they were. It was at the temple gate um, that they healed this guy, or they brought about the oh, healing right. of this guy. And he's, pr my imagination is he's probably like, yes, here's the story, you know, here's the scripture, you know, and yeah, you killed him because you thought he was blaspheming and claiming to be the Messiah, which according to law is punishable by death. If you're wrong, <laughs> he rose. And we are still claiming that he is the Messiah. Come at me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. Uh, okay. you, you wrongly killed him. But crazy enough as that is, that was God's plan. Right. 
And it was prophesied for thousands of years that this would happen. Welcomes, welcome to God's will. <laughs> And you are, you as the chosen people are still part of the plan. So we're going to see tomorrow in chapter four that this is going to really piss off some of the leaders in the temple and they're going to, they're going to arrest them. Yeah. Um, I, I, admittedly, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this message, I think, is is probably convicting, right? Some of them, probably convicting all of them, and and they're feeling, and some are responding in a way that's repentant, right? And others are responding in a way that's like, no, you're going down. We're going to try to shut them up. Um, huh. What are the, what other sort of well, thoughts? Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, just after you said that, I had a thought of like, you know, the comparison between the people that repent, you know, and, and you know, accept that he was Messiah and that he was. And then the people that were like, oh, no, you know, let's let's take these guys down that didn't repent, that kind of still rejected that fact. I wonder if, you know, they were like, oh, man, this guy really was the Messiah. And if we crucified him. They were trying to cover it up, you know, because they thought like they didn't hear the other side of the message other than he was the Messiah. And they were like fearful that they had just crucified the Messiah, but didn't understand, mm. understand what his resurrection truly meant. Mm hmm. They were still thinking more from a worldly kind of worldly king perspective and and right. politically what the implications were to them of killing the earthly messiah even if he was well, actually the earthly messiah <laughs> well even if if they didn't you know like what if they didn't understand that it was god's plan like we do today that he would be crucified risen you know maybe they still thought i mean even peter thought this way too of like no jesus you're messiah you have to stay with us it's god with us you can't die like you're coming to save save you know the whole earth and you're gonna do it now and not you know die and resurrect it their vision is still like, oh, we killed the one guy who could save us or you know, kind of liberate our people or something. And and they're like, well, now what? You're just, you know, screwed again. <laughs> yeah. Because we crucified him. Oops. So then they're like trying to cover it up. What do you think? Like, what do you think they thought about his resurrection? Do you think they believe that he'd actually like all the stories that they were hearing about him resurrecting from the dead? Or do you think they're like, oh, that's lies? Well, I think if they thought it was lies, then I think they wouldn't think that or wouldn't believe that he was Messiah. So like they heard that he resurrected and they're like, oh, he really was the Messiah. Oops. <laughs> hmm. So like I think it was I think it was like them realizing resurrection, and this is all just 
hypothetical. I'm like thinking, you're right. Of like what could be going through their heads. And stuff. I'd be afraid that if he, if he had resurrected from the dead, I'd be afraid that he would come after me. It's kind of like come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like gang, like I'm thinking about like gangs, right? Like the cartel, right. and like you have you know, the the one cartel and the other cartel, and this cartel kills the leader of this cartel, and you're like, all right, we got him, and then all of a sudden you hear he's raised from the dead, is like come back from the dead, is like, oh crap, he's gonna come and kill us. We're toast. Yeah. <laughs> like that'd be terrifying yeah. to me. Like. <laughs> Yeah. He's going to get revenge, right? Yeah. Matthew. But it doesn't seem Matthew. to phase them. Like, they're they're still going after the believers, the followers of Jesus. So they don't seem to be afraid in that sense that, like, Jesus is going to come back and come after Dude. them. Right. I don't know. There was. I just looked it up. Matthew 28, 11 starts actually um, the the while the women were on their way to the tomb some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened i.e the resurrection when the chief priests had melt, met with the elders and devised a plan they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Hush money. Yeah. So the story was the disciples took the body under cover of night. And they've come up with this story that he's resurrected from the dead. Right. That was started by the priests okay. in Jerusalem. And they, and they, so they were like, they knew very, very early on that Jesus had at least disappeared from his grave. But, but according to the guards, I think, did the guards tell them the story? Like, there was like the supernatural thing that happened and the angels. And... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's the resurrection on the Sabbath day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel's clothes were like lightning. His, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became oh like God. dead men. Okay. So they saw, they saw the whole thing. Yeah. And they told the priest exactly what they saw. Yeah. Wow. An angel appeared and freaked us out and we passed out. So what? That's crazy. It's crazy that the priests are like, I guess it's just the fear that, oh my God, what did we do? We have to cover this up in some way. We have to. It's loss of power. Mm -hmm. They see their thousands of years of tradition that they've been divinely granted this authority being taken away. Right. And I think somewhere even Jesus says that this, like the whole, you are a brood of vipers and other such analogies describing priests, describing the, Levites of look, you, there was one where he's like, you were given this task to shepherd my people before the Messiah came and you failed. Therefore I am taking that authority back and giving it to someone who can do it right. Ouch. Also at stake is their position of safety and authority within, you know, the Roman kind of construct that's in place, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do they call that? They call it a, uh, 
a uh, what's it called when a when a country comes in and kind of takes over and they're like controlling the people. There's a word for it, like um, occupation. Yeah. So they have a safe position in the Roman Roman occupation. They're probably they're they're paid well. They eat well. They have nice homes. They're safe from kind of the you know the day to day the Roman oppression. Yeah. And now that's all going to be threatened potentially. And so the so I feel like that may, might be another motivator. I don't know, I have a sense that if we kind of follow through what would happen if as a priest in this cozy little life I have, if I admit that Jesus is the Messiah and submit my life to him, what does that look like to me, my family? How does it affect my, you know, my bubble, my nice safe bubble that I have? Seems like it pops it. <laughs> yeah. And who wants that to happen? Really? Yeah. I sure don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a terrifying prospect. I mean, it's terrifying just thinking, oh, wow. What would happen if my life went in such a direction that I felt voluntarily compelled to give up my job away, go somewhere else, start again. I don't want to, I have a place of security. I am, I am set, you know? Yeah. It, it seems like it would require it, right? Like you, like making that choice, you're giving up everything and, and, and you're intentionally just, laying yourself out there and being like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm probably going to suffer terribly. Um, and, but I'm going to do this anyway, because it's the right thing to do. Like, right. I kind of get it. <laughs> oh man. Hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what they did at the beginning of acts too. They were like, yep, here, we're going to sell all our belongings, kind of make the first church commune. You know, we'll share everything, but, you know, all of our personal belongings and stuff is just going away so that we can start this church, basically. Yep. They're, I mean, they, you know, you know, some of them, you know, I think, because it, it had to have been more than just the 12 disciples, but like, and not even, because not all of the 12 disciples were there starting the church, right? And, well, or were all, they were all 11 of them. Judas was not. Yeah. But that was like the, that was like Acts number one is, we got to replace, replace Judas, all 11 Judas. of us. That's, Rock, paper, scissors for Judas's replacement. Then there's, I imagine there was others, you know, kind of in the crowd that were selling their belongings to to help the disciples do this. So they were kind of getting out outside of their bubble, safe zone, I think. Because I think about the disciples and I'm like, yeah, they did that when they first followed Jesus. So it's like, They, they've been out of that safety net, you know, safe bubble for, you know, a few years now. Mm. Yeah, they dropped everything to follow him. But now other people are starting to drop everything to start, you know, start Jesus' the church. Right. I think the secret sauce or the magic or whatever you want to call it in this specifically is that they did so as a community. They did so together. It would be terrifying to do that alone. Alone. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that brings up Genesis. And even even what Pastor Jonathan was talking about, you know, like like knowing God, yeah, that can be like a an individual thing, but you know, maybe sometimes it takes a community to know God. And then finding freedom, it's like you can't do that without a community. And then discovering your purpose, like he's like, Yeah, some people have done it without you know, others, but most of the time it's like somebody's going to be helping you discover your purpose and then find her making a difference, you know, that requires community too. So it's like this whole thing of like, yeah, you can't, you can't do it alone. It takes, and I think that makes it more digestible for me. Because sometimes I think it's like, yeah, I got to make this decision, drop everything. We have to, you know, I've got to pick up and move my family to the middle of nowhere in some foreign country, you know, to, to teach these people about Jesus so that we can advance his kingdom. I'm like, eh, yeah, that's, you know, knowing that it's, you know, a community, it's like, okay, if I had, you know, you know, six to 12 other guys that wanted to do that with me, then yeah, maybe. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Right. And even so, sorry, Daniel, you're, uh, were you going to say something else? I was, I was just kind of saying sorry to Daniel because he was looking for something in Genesis when oh, I yes. thought of that. Oh, the thing I was looking in Genesis was Genesis two eighteen. The Lord God said, after he had created Adam, it is not good for the man to be alone. Yeah. I will make a helper suitable for him. It's like, no, we weren't meant to function alone. I feel like the, you know, the, the leaders, they would have had to come to that community like they, they had the opportunity, I think, to come into that community, right? And to be a part of it. Um, but they, it would have required a, certainly a lot of humility and being like admitting, wow, I was wrong. I'm so sorry, <laughs> you know? Man, what, it would have been amazing to see all of this, be a part of it, be in that community and just like even see that playing out like leaders in the, you know, the, the synagogue and coming to the coming to them being like having the recognition that Jesus was was the Messiah and the conviction of of what they had done and been like, I'm so sorry. And, and then the welcoming arms of the, of the brothers, and the beautiful moment of repentance and, and grace. And, and. I feel heretical for saying it, but it's like, even still when, when it talks about how, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold, saying that his Christ would suffer. I still can't, I can help it, but I don't like to help imagining him sitting back like an evil genius. Ha ha, you, this was my plan all along. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it is, it is odd. I guess it's his nature to, there's a, another 
I don't know if it's in the Psalms or where it is, but like, it's just a song, a worship song, a more recent worship song. It's like, he turns all things for good. Or he makes all things for good. Can't remember the song, but I, I think it's a scripture verse. But his, his nature is to turn things that were meant for evil. He would turn it into something good and beautiful. Yeah. It brings up a picture that I've maybe fabricated myself um, regarding just the cosmic reality that God created and how it's like all of time, all the entire thing is like a giant painting, a canvas mm. <clears throat> that was started, finished, perfected. Satan came in, just splattered black all over it haphazardly. And the rest of time is God coming in and just detailing the black spots and making those a part of it and turning those into something equally as beautiful. He's oh. like, he's like, I can work with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. That's a cool picture. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think it's maybe time to wrap it up here. Well, uh, what do you guys like to pray us out for today? I can pray us out. All right, Lord. Mm. Loved our conversation today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for speaking to us today. God, this is an amazing time in the church, the very beginning. Um, thank you for opening our eyes to what was happening and, and how this applies to our lives and, and what it means for us, Lord, to live out your, your faith and your truth. God, speak to us today and bring new revelation uh, of how we can live this out and what it means for us in our families and in our community. God, thank you for this time. Jesus, in your name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Amen.